Professor Neil Miller, welcome to the show. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me, Jared. No worries. So you're you're speaking from Glasgow over in Scotland and I'm I'm down under here in Australia. So through the wonders of the internet, uh, we get to chat and, and talk about all things tendons, which I know is a is a passion of yours. Before we get into the nitty gritty though, Neil, I want my listeners to know a little bit more about you. Describe your Monday to Friday as best you can and also some hobbies that you perhaps might enjoy if you get some yeah. free time. Uh, yeah, so uh, thanks again for having me, I suppose. So, I mean, to start off, I'll apologise. I am an orthopaedic surgeon, but we'll try and get past that in the podcast. Um, you are an so orthopaedic, I... all right, we have to stop the, stop yeah. the show there, Neil. <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's enough. <laughs> so, um, my, so, I'm a chair in uh, orthopaedics in Glasgow. I'm mainly a shoulder surgeon, but I do lots of other tendon-type surgeries. So, Monday's my operating day, all day I usually do rotator cuff repairs, instability, shoulder replacements. Tuesday, Wednesday, I normally have in the lab or I'm traveling um, uh, uh, most of the time now. And then Thursday, I do a fra- an upper limb fracture clinic, which was I uh, didn't used to do, but because of COVID, I took on and actually I secretly enjoy, but don't tell anybody. Mm-hmm. And then on a Friday, I have my normal clinic and my clinic really is a complex tendon clinic that makes you quite depressed by the end of it so I look forward to a Friday evening for a glass of wine um hobby wise so I've got four daughters so I don't really have any hobbies because I'm just so bloody busy with them um uh, but I do you know I enjoy DIY and things like that gardening you may uh, so um that's my main sort of hobbies but I have no free time and I don't really speak in the house because there's five female voices. <laughs> as, it should, <laughs> as it should be, Neil. So as it should be. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to get back to your, your working week because it sounds quite varied and diverse, which is, I'm going to say, unusual for an orthopedic surgeon from my experience. Anyway, how did you get into the, the, the complex tendon clinic and, and all those other uh, sorts of things? I, yeah, so I, I mean, my journey really, I went to Sydney in as a med student and then back in uh, 2005 and six to work with George Morell out in Cogra in Sydney and he is a an, an atypical orthopedic surgeon he has a basic science background but operates and I think that inspired me to want to do that in my own practice because I thought that we we both thought at the time that tendons the basic science was really poor it wasn't mm-hmm. done to a level that you would expect of cancer biology or cardiac disease we were really way way behind and when I came back and the post here um, I find that pa- patients with multiple tendinopathies or problematic tendon patients were getting a bit of a rough deal. And uh, so we set up, myself and a rheumatologist, uh, set up a sort of complex tendon clinic. So that was for people who were recalcitrant to physio or recalcitrant to other treatments who basically had lost their way, as well as patients with multiple, you know, the borderline um, spondyloarthropathy type arthritic patient with multiple tendinopathies that were probably mechanical and then also we I also do a lot of fluoroquinolone toxicity patient work so that now has meant that we actually I run a UK wide uh, we also take some patients from the states and, and Europe sometimes a UK wide sort of complex tendon clinic where we're funded to see the, the ones that are really struggling in a field uh mostly every other management Mm -hmm. so they are taxing i would say they're i always say when i'm giving a talk if anybody asks you to set up a complex tendinopathy clinic run out of the room because it 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 takes a lot but i find it very rewarding because i think these patients um have had poor advice per treatment some most of the time and actually and you'll never hear an orthopedic surgeon say this again but a lot of the biopsychosocial aspect of it needs to be explored with them to get them back on track to a rehabilitation program uh, and so I, I look I quite in, enjoy that and I think there's a need for it um but yeah that's it's not without its challenges let's put it like that Neil you've become my favorite orthopedic surgeon by simply uttering the biopsychosocial <laughs> framework which I you're right I've never I've never heard before and I, I love how you've you've uh You've, you've you've chosen the challenge of doing this complex tendon clinic when you could make a perfectly good living out of just doing your cuff repairs and your your normal whatever hopefully not a lot of subacromial decompressions these days but certainly there's a lot of shoulder surgery work out there so so kudos to you for doing that is it something that you would 
you would like to see perhaps a bit more of in orthopedics, like orthopedic surgeons going outside their comfort zone and looking at more complex pathology? Yeah, I think, I think, or, I mean, I, I, at the end of a lot of my talks now, who I give to some, I give to orthopedic surgeons, I, I sort of say, look, the musculoskeletal disease treatment is changing, not just in tendon, in OA, in other diseases that you treat a lot. And it's changing towards a biologic or drug related era that we can probably manipulate disease other than operating on people. And you're either going to embrace that and get on the train, or you're going to be off the train and somebody else is going to be prescribing those drugs and looking after your patients. Uh, we know where orthopedic surgeons, you know, type A personalities, you know, can be pains in the ass. But if you, you're you smart enough, I always say to them, you're, you've got the level of intelligence and interest in that you should embrace this era, you know, liaise with other, you know, like physiotherapists, like sports physicians, and understand that you having these patients in your office and treating them with a drug, you're still going to improve them. They're still going to need to see you. You need to start to adapt and move forward. Because if you're just going to operate, we can all do a cuff repair and all do a hip replacement, but the 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 disease, the way we treat patients in all diseases, cancer, cardiovascular, you know, pancreatic cancer, we're changing towards a personalized uh, era. And we need to, um, as I say, we need to pivot and be there. And if we don't, we're just, we will get left behind and rheumatologists, sports physicians, physiotherapy prescribing will take your patients. And that's, that is the reality of the world moving yeah. forward. Yeah. Yeah. So jump on or, or get left behind. Yeah. That's a good incentive. So yeah. before we get into the, to the, the, to the tendon chat, I want to ask you very quickly, what book are you reading right now, Neil? And TV not, show I, or TV show? So teams book, I bought a book in the summer. I still haven't got around to reading it. <laughs> um, but I'm watching, I am obsessed. And I, I don't know where this has come from. I'm obsessed with Yellowstone. I just... I have no idea because I'm not really into horses, but I, I I I just can't stop watching it. I literally was I was taking one of my daughters to hockey the other night, and I have half an hour where I have an hour where I have to wait for it. I was just in the car with my four year old listening to Frozen, but I'm on watching <laughs> Yellowstone. I just I don't know. So maybe maybe you'll find me with the steps and <laughs> rope me some. I don't know next year, and I'll have given up tendons. So that's, yeah, that's you'll, you'll be in Montana with. on the on the Dutton Ranch. Uh, exactly. Watch it. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I've watched I've watched all of it. I think, and it's uh, it's it's a, it's oh, maybe it appeals to a life that we want to live. You know, you're out there, you're I on think, the land. I think that's maybe. I think it's so yeah. abstract to being an orthopedic surgeon. You know, it's so out there that I think I could just go and do that. I could just go and do that. <laughs> <laughs> screw all these complex tendons i just want to go exactly exactly i'm going to go and rope a horse or something <laughs> all right i'm sorry mate i'm going to bring you back to tendons so yep. so neil where where are we with tendons in terms of the genesis of of tendinopathy is it is it a simple model of overload without adequate repair time or is it something more multifaceted and rich and complex i, I look I, I think I, I think tendon research is in a very good place in that we have now reached the stage where we are doing ex well excellent basic science alongside better, not wonderful, but better clinical trialing. And I think that has revealed that this adage that it's just mechanical loading, clearly that's a part of it and probably a very large part of it. But there are many other, it's multifactorial. There are many other um avenues that drive this disease and you need to consider you know inflammatory mechanisms apoptotic mechanisms uh, you know environmental reasons you know look at the, the look at diabetes and metabolic disturbance we haven't really got to the bottom of that although we know it's a factor uh, smoking and you know you know socioeconomic deprivation and how patients who you know have a crappy life, get tendinopathy and have a crappier life, you know, so it's, it is a, it is a multifactorial disease. And this old ad is that it's just, you know, I'm, I don't prescribe to it, it's just mechanical loading. Well, clearly that's important to certain subgroups. And this is why I like Karen Silberger's work is that, you know, finally we were talking about subgroups and precision tendinopathy a few years ago. She's now nicely highlighted that in a group of, you know, Achilles patients, you know, looking at, what who and what might respond you know this activity dominant psychosocial 
and then structure. So look, there's a lot of, um, sometimes I find there's a lot of moaning in the tendon community. Um, and I think that's because it's diverse. There's orthopedic surgeons, there's physio physical therapists, there's physiotherapists, sports, there's, there's a lot of different groups. Mm. Sometimes maybe if we just talk to one another and um, better, I think we could probably figure out a lot of this multifactorial and treat our patients better actually. Mm. So look, you could take the tack that, well, we, what have we discovered in tendinopathy? Have we just revealed more complexity? Yes, but by revealing that complexity, we are ultimately going to treat the patients better, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. We do tend to, between professions, physio, orthopedics, sports physician, rheumatologist, whoever you may see, we tend to compete in terms of how we're going to manage these tendons and it, it really frustrates me and it's also it's different in terms of who you go to i don't know what it's like over there here in australia if you were to go to a sports physician for a grumpy achilles you you you, you might be suggested exercise but you're quickly going to find yourself sort of recommended some type of injection be it a yeah. prp be it a cortisone be it a high volume injection or whatever it may be and that's, that's frustrating for me. And this is why I liked your paper in, in Nature, the primer on, on tendinopathy, because you kind of had a few people from different backgrounds uh, contributing to the paper. So do you think the management of an individual with a tendinopathy will be better if most professions who come to see people with tendinopathy were giving similar advice rather than totally disparate advice? Yeah, yeah I think that's, I mean, I could be pretty brutal and say, you know, a lot, of a part of the problems with tendons is it's highly prevalent and therefore people can make a lot of cash out of it mm. and by that i think that is a driver for substandard early treatment i think would will not say it's just the sports physicians because equally if you go to a clinic in new york with a cuff or a, or a patellar you'll end up with a prp injection if you see yeah. a surgeon so we're not just we'll not have a go at just the sports physicians <laughs> but we could but we won't um I think, yeah, I, it astonishes me when I see a complex patient about how crap the treatment has been. And I'm going to get at physios here as well, here, in that there's no standardized logical thought process sometimes in, in, the, in the early phases. And you flip around with different, multiple different exercises, different um, interpretation of what the patient's feeling. And that's why we come up, that's why I actually wrote that paper and got together you know a good group of physiotherapists sports phys you know a diff you know the people we are treat a group of people who really treat this disease and that's why we come up with a framework of get the diagnosis right spend time with your patient at the start listen to them you know are you missing something like a, a spondylarthropathy are you missing that they're grossly depressed that they lost so you know listen to them educate them acknowledge them think about their fear mechanisms and then start a loading program. The evidence so is so in the favor of that. Start something sensible and logical tailored to that patient. Is it isometrics? Is it eccentrics? What have they tried before? Energy, you know, talk to them. That's the most important. And remember 99% of the time, the patient usually is right and will give you the indicators of what they need. Then if the loading program isn't working, you know, sit down, you can change it, but do not rush in with, non-proven adjunct therapies early because a lot of the time that is what the killer can be you can have a prp start gtn too early when actually then their cusp that their loading program just needed they just needed a couple of sessions of either you know isotonics or you know uh, you know just something a little bit different so it, it frustrates me um that that it still happens and um, i think it is getting i think it is getting better um, and I think it will get better as no, more novel treatments come on board for recalcitrant uh, treatments because all of these treatments that we're developing um, will only be for secondary. These are not going to be something you're going to walk into your clinic and be given a biological drug. These are for patients who maybe six, 12 months down the line aren't responding and need, a, need some sort of adjunct to help, you know, mm. a, a dysregulated inflammatory response or a dysregulated whatever so yeah i i i i sent i can understand your frustration but i think all we can do as a group is continually educate that load management should be the first port of call and but there's a lot of 
there's a lot of heavy lifting around load management and you have to appreciate that and get the patient to accept that. And that's not always easy. I mean, in a typical Glasgow patient, if, if they come in with an Achilles tendon, as I always say, Achilles tendon up, then I say, look, you need to do these 15, you, know, you need to do these exercises for 12 weeks. It'll be about 15,000 rep, repetitions. The first word usually begins with an F mm -hmm. and the second word probably it usually ends with an off. And that is because it's hard. It's hard in life now to commit to exercise regimes. And maybe we need to say, right, here's a bit of load management, but walk 7,000 steps a day for mm. four out of seven of the days. Maybe we, a lot of the time, focus wholly on these set of exercises when actually generic health plus a bit of exercise might be. So and that's what we do sometimes in the complex tendon clinic because we can't give them we can't load them always how we want to because they're just not conditioned and therefore we switch that around and say right you know first week we're going to do two thousand steps third second week we're going to do three we're going to take this slowly we're going to add in a you know an isometric at week three and, and that's what we do and it's time consuming but it can help the patient mm. I'll, um, I agree with you having a go at physios too. So thank you for that. We'll tee off on each other in every profession. But um, the, the, the physio, you say, it, you say at large, it might be getting better or that's your sense. I'm not so optimistic. I still see some horrific physio around with people getting <laughs> fric friction massage on their Achilles for six months, you know, or dry needling into that, which, you know, it is what it is. It, it might be a fine adjunct, no exercise or just a calf yeah. stretch and a calf rub. And and then same with rotator cuff related shoulder pain, rotator cuff tendinopathy, which is my area of interest. You get people just getting an upper trap massage and then a pec stretch, you know, and it's just, yeah. it's woefully inadequate in terms of trying to change the capacity of that tendon. So yeah. I, I'm a pessimist, Look, mate. I, it's still bad. I am trying to be optimistic. Look, I could wax lyrical about physiotherapy regimes I've seen but look it's I would argue that it's not easy being a you know it's not easy being a physiotherapist actually it's not easy um it's, it's sometimes not an attractive career it's hard work and therefore you've got to cut the, you know they're not doing it intentionally I think the onus should be on people like me helping and educating and maybe putting things out there to help them with patients but I agree they're you know, physiotherapy trials are hard. We're not great at trialing in this indication. And so, look, I have, I'm not as pessimistic as you, um, but I, I agree there are some woeful things done. But maybe, you know, let's not forget that it is, it's a tough, like here in the UK at the moment, a band five newly qualified physiotherapists is paid crap. Mm. Um, mm. Do they have the, do they have the drive and ambition to, spend 45 minutes with a patient when they're getting you know it, there's a lot of other issues around physiotherapy we could go into about why maybe that profession why why that why people are moving more quickly on to adjuncts mm. you know money to, you know so I, I i can be kind about physiotherapy too <laughs> So it's not. No, you're right. I, I was I was playing devil's advocate. It's yes. there are many forces which are uh, sort of leading to that low value care, or perhaps a lack of critical thinking, or a or a lack of passion. Frankly, because if you're yeah. grinding through the week and getting paid nothing, and I worked in London for a couple of years, and I got paid half of what I get paid here in Australia, yeah. doing more hours, which was criminal. Um, yeah, it's yeah. tough to find that passion to translate that into clinical care you know care. but i still think that if you are you've chosen to go into it, it's a profession and it's a it's a yeah. it's a profession that's founded and based in science and critical thinking yeah. then if they listen to this podcast there should be some improvement there at, at scale yeah. so i want to yeah. i want to get more spe okay do you want to go on mate yeah no 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 go ahead no you're fine I want, to, I want to get specific here for a minute because we're just gonna we're gonna run out of time i can see where we're going to go here i want to talk about so I'm an Australian physio and I was trained roughly around the time this continuum model of tendinopathy was proposed by Jill Cook and Craig Purdom around 20, 2009, 2010, which was a really a, appealing and elegant and a, an attractive model. Actually, I found that it highlighted the stages of a tendinopathy. It also showed how you would manage various stages of the tendinopathy. And then also actually showed that the tendon 
was adaptable and, and could perhaps change. You know, it could be reactive here, but we could get it back to normal, so on and so forth. So I want to ask you, because I haven't really read about it for, for five or six years, how's that model sitting in, in contemporary tendon research? Look, I think there was always a place. At, at the time, it was, yeah, it was fields leading. I would argue that I didn't really, you know, it, it said it was looking at the basic science aspect of it. And it, it did at the time, but the basic science at the time was crap, right? Mm -hmm. So you're putting... You're, you're developing a model and I, I get that it was what the theory, et cetera, around it, but the basic science really was not great and the understanding was not great at that time. And so it gave a very, I think it got a reasonably prescriptive, but I think the, the, the field needed at that point. I think it's moved, for me, it's moved on from there. I think it's a useful, I mean, they updated it uh, recently and I think it has a place, um, it certainly has a place, but this like the science has moved on quite considerably here. We now know that we probably should be targeting in 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 early disease. There's mechanisms we can be targeting quicker with maybe drugs in certain subsets of patients rather than being wholly physio and loading management centric. And we need to be ready to adapt to that. Uh, um, so look, uh, it, it it's always going to be out there in the field, and I think it is useful. As a, as a as a guide um I'm, I'm not you know the reactive tendinopathy i never really liked that word but you know it's more that that for me that's the initial you know molecular insults that are actually really important that then leads on to dis dysregulation or disrepair they they talk about and then this i don't like the word degenerative tendinopathy because it belittles um it, it's a bit like OA wear and tear it really doesn't explain the complexity of uh, the disease degenerative tendinopathy really led on to the whole thing that there was no inflammation and 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 that mm. argument which which i suppose irritated me because we were discovering so many different things at the time and it took us we have this i'm just back from dallas at the orthopedic research society and i look, was giving it you know it took us really 10 years to to change the or get into the field that actually inflammatory mechanisms here are pretty important not inflammation, not clinical inflammation. And, and therefore, so I, I think we're modernizing. Um, uh, and I so, I, I, so look, I think it was good at the time. I'm not wedded to it now. And I think that over the next, I think next five years with a lot of the work coming out in clinical trialing in these subsets of patients that Karen has highlighted, I think more trials, with more good physical therapy trials will look at those subset of patients and you'll know when somebody sits in front of you for the first time after a questionnaire and a chat with them, you, you, you'll you see them as a psychosocial dominant patient and you will tailor your treatment to that versus you'll see somebody who maybe is an, has an inflat you know is going to be recalcitrant, recalcitrant to load and maybe you want to add in a molecular adjunct much earlier because they're giving symptoms or signs. So that's where I think as a field, we will change or move away from a from a, a mo I'm not I'm not a big fan of models anyway, but that's um that's where I think we are now. Do you mind if we linger for a bit on on inflammation? So I I remember when I was over in in London working, I met up with Jonathan Reese who who wrote a paper yep. on in inflammatory or. I know Johnny, but, right? Yeah, yeah, Johnny and I share a lot of complex. Yeah. He's he's the London ones. Yeah, he, he's a lovely chap and we we met a lot of times and shared patients um with tendinopathies and i read this paper on because cook and perdom i was like nah there's no inflammation in, in tendinopathy what is this it's all a big myth and then i read john's paper and then i, I had to look him up and, and have a chat with him so so what so there are inflammatory mechanisms involved in tendinopathy however yeah. it's not the classic inflammation where you perhaps roll your ankle and you get an ankle sprain and you get the swelling and the yeah. and the cardinal signs of, of that. Yeah. I mean, we were taught, I suppose the clinicians were always taught, you know, high CRP, high HR, hot, swollen. And, and therefore it was difficult to convince a set of clinicians that actually when you take a biopsy from a tendon that is under at early tendinopathy, there are hugely dysregulated inflammatory mechanisms, inflammatory molecules and mediators and mechanisms that are going on that tendon that are actually driving the, that are the predominant driver of that disease at that time. 
So it took a long time to con help contextualize that for clinicians, mm. but, uh, which is understandable. And also the science, you know, from, you know, the science radically changed from the Cook Purdom sort of era in that, you know, it was, it was no longer okay to just say, right, well, we find a molecule that was up, that was down, crack on, and it must be important. You know, science now, we take biopsies, we look, interrogate it at a level, you know, we look at the, we look at single cell, uh, you know, RNA sequencing, we look at subclusters of cells, we look at what molecules, how they do, we backtrack it into mice, we put it into humans. It's really moved on significantly. Mm -hmm. You know, we're now doing, we've just finished a bio, you know, we finished the IL and the IL-17 trial for a teeter cuff tendinopathy. So that was taking stuff we found in my lab and now we systemically injected, you know, into the stomach an anti-cytokine treatment for cuff tendinopathy. And it's crazy if you think about it. But, you know, in a subset of 40 patients with real, who had early tendinopathy less than six months and whose wart score was really you know, high or you know, they were really painful, they got significantly better than a saline comparator. And it was, and this was out till, you know, week 16. So mm -hmm. we, what all we're saying is I'm not saying that everybody that's going to walk into a clinic room is going to need an anti-inflammatory. Get that out. That's just crazy. What I'm saying is that those mechanisms are driving a dysregulated matrix response. And maybe in, in a subset of patients, which we'll figure out, targeting them with load, because let's remember all those patients in the biologicals trial still get loaded, um, got will get better. And therefore we should be as a, field try at the end of the day why are we doing all this the patient sits in front of us you want to make them better do you really care what happens in a mouse no so we need to get treatments to make them better mm. and i think we are doing that um, and i think the inflammatory i think inflammation is more readily accept or inflammatory mechanisms are more readily acceptable i think when we publish a few more uh, trials with novel mediators then it will filter to the field and maybe there'll be more acceptance. That takes time. It takes time. Yeah. So inflammatory mechanisms being present or or the or the causal mechanisms underpinning the onset of tendinopathy does not mean we're harking back to rest, ice, anti inflammatory oh, no, tendinopathy. No, I just want absolutely to make that not. clear. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. That is crystal clear. You will yeah. listen, if you're low if load the pay, I would always people always ask me, oh what's your treatment? I always say load the bloody patient just yeah. do that to start off with and get them back and listen to them i would always say that we're not going to change the paradigm where somebody's going to come in and get an anti-inflammatory and rest absolutely not <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated you talked about that interleukin study uh a moment ago how much can you speak about that neil is it all yeah of... so we can that's in that's in revision for yeah. uh, publication so i presented that so i can talk a bit i can talk a bit about that that was i mean you, you look in the in the tendon world we have to be a bit braver than what we've been and we have to take risks and that trial was risky and it actually it never met its primary outcome so you could argue that we failed and i would argue that if we're not failing we're probably not doing it right anyway but in a group so that was 96 that was 333 patients screened to three us sites glasgow's the main uk site and then we had three EU sites. We had 96 patients, so 49 in the IL-17 arm and whatever in the in the placebo arm. And the placebo was injection of saline into the stomach. And when you looked at all those patients, I can't show you the graphs, but basically the graphs showed no difference in all comers. And the, that, what I always love and I always show is the patients got significantly better when they were injected with saline into their stomach. Okay? So this is, you know... For, this is where the conundrum with tendon comes. You know, they were given a loading program, the moon protocol for cuff. They'd failed physiotherapy. They'd failed non-steroidals. They were allowed to have had two injections. So these were the patients who, you know, were going to have a, a pointless subacromial decompression if they saw an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> but, but when we looked again at those, and the reason we probably did the, it failed its primary outcome is it's the first time we'd ever done a trial like that. Huge investment. I mean, Novartis, the drug company, this is millions of dollars of investment. Um, and we learned a lot. And when we reanalyzed re the data, we took the tact that actually the, the patients that had high or dysregulated IL-17 in my patient cohort, 
biopsies were always early patients. It wasn't late patients. So we then went back in and said, right, if the, if the patient's symptoms are less than six months and they're really bloody sore, how does that look in the analysis? Well, and we, we did this at various time points. And we find that there was clear separation in the early patients, so less than six months of symptoms, and who were really probably a vast score of around six or seven. You're really pretty painful. And therefore, that has led to that trial will now go to, there's a phase three starting in later this year, which I'll lead. And that's a 426 patient worldwide trial in that subset of patients to use anti-IL-17 for recalcitrant cuff tendinopathy. And I, look, that's where the field needs to go to challenge and change. And it is a bit, I would say we had only two, if you, most uh, musculoskeletal tra clinical trials, whether it be OA or tendon, you normally have a dropout rate of about 20, you know, 20% 20 because patients get annoyed with filling forms out. Only two patients in that trial um, were, were dropouts. And if you spoke to all the patients, they loved the fact that it didn't disrupt their life. They came for their injection. They did their physio. They didn't have to take time off for surgery. So actually we, and when you looked at the graph, when you looked at the subset, you know, why those patients got better, uh, you, you know, it wasn't, they improved their pain, their psychosocial, their emotional scale improved, their workplace improved and their lifestyle improved, which shows us that and we know that drug works in those areas and inflammation does work, remember, in the brain, et cetera. And, and um, so that's how it shows you the areas we probably need to treat moving forward with inflammatory mechanisms are around the patient, you know, as a whole, rather than just thinking we have to make their pain better. Mm. Did the saline group get an improvement in the psycho-emotional or psychosocial? Uh, Not well? when you sub subgrouped it. No, they didn't. No. Okay. So that's an interest, you know, so yeah. there's a lot to, there's a lot to pick apart in that trial. And we will, we, that is, that will be published over the next couple of months. Um, and that uh, should be in nature communication. So I'll, um, if, that should come out later. And it is an interest. I find it fascinating. I find the placebo response fascinating um, in, in tendon as well. But, you know, one of the pre questions you'd ask, and what we might talk about also is, is structure is that we never, there's this paradigm that we never see sometimes in trials a structure improvement, but the patient gets better. Mm. And where are we going with that? I think we, we do need to probably demonstrate structural improvement with some of these newer therapies so that we can um, show patients and demonstrate right here's a defect in your tendon we are improving it and therefore you can we can up your load or we can do this and, and physically be able to show them because I think a lot of it is psychosocial in that you're not going to harm this tendon it is getting better here's how we're going to do that it's not more drug the drug has done this now but you're going to now with this improved structure be able to load it back to you know get your tendon health back to 80 90 percent and then and the overall improve so i'm a big we had a, a we had a discussion about this a few key opinion leaders in, in dallas and really we felt that we as a field probably need to start focusing a bit more on structure moving forward in trials to to figure to help figure that out and help people and and so we're we are going to try and do that a little bit more in, in, in future trials to sort of, so, so, so do you take... think that's, sorry, mate, do you think that's important no, no. from a, from a patient confidence perspective, or do you think improving the structure will improve clinical outcomes because the structure is better? I think it's both. I think mm. it's both, but you need to, we need to connect with the, we need to show the patient some benefits, some physical, if you, you know, if you look, if you take a, a, a rheumatoid patient who's having a flare of a joint and you give them, uh, TNF or one of the new IL, you know, 17 blockers, and they come back to your clinic in six six weeks, they will have an event. All rheumatologists care about now is structure. Mm. So they have flipped completely. They want to see an MRI improvement in the structure of that joint of the of the cartilage or the less synovitis so that they know they're getting the patient into remission so that their lifestyle will improve, they can function and they can get back to work. So rheumatologists treat patients, you know, this, this paradigm, we don't treat the scan, we treat the patient. Of course, we always treat the patient, but they are treating the scan because they know from all trials that are done and, and the concept is that if we improve the structure, 
the patient will ultimately get better after that. So I, I, I'm i toying, yeah, I'm debating that in the tend and field at the moment. And my personal opinion is what you said, is that if the structure is better, we can actually load it and, and give it, uh, get it better, but also physically showing a patient that there's been some improvement in structure, I feel would have a huge influence on their outcome. Mm. Will we? And just to say to everybody, will we get there? I'm not so sure. I think there's a long way to go with this. So don't. I'm not saying this is imminent around the corner. I think this is, um, this is a long game. But I would hope that we could be, like the way rheumatologists are now, and that we can give a patient and say, here's an exercise program you failed. Here's a drug with an exercise program. Here's a scan. It's look how it's improved. Continue with your load management, and you'll get there. And we get them better and not work for everybody but that's that would be an ideal world i'll tell you what it'll make our job a lot easier if i could say let's do this and then we'll verify with imaging down the track look it's improved yeah. by 30 percent, 50 percent. there's less inflammatory blah 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 in the tendon blah, blah whatever we could take a biopsy there's all these things we could do to quantify yes. the change right and then yeah. that would feed into that patient beliefs and psychology so much and then incentivize continued exercise, Except, so yeah. on and so forth. Ra yeah, rather than when they come back and they've done their loading program and they're still as moaning as they were when they first yeah. presented at the clinic. And, and you know, and I would argue, okay, so they come back and the structure's, if the structure's better and patients say, well, I'm still painful. But then, as you say, you've got a hook to say, well, look, you are doing a good job. Your tissue is healing. Keep going. And I would argue that those, I would agree with you, that would drastically change, I feel, patient outcome because they would be incentivized and they would see that loading is in, or with plus minus whatever it is, is working. So mm. I'm completely in agreement with you. Yeah, I, anchoring these ethereal concepts of getting better or not to something objective and quantifiable is so important for patients. And I'm, I, with recent evidence that's come out, I'm going to go to the lumbar spine for just a minute of like disc herniations that can heal. Sometimes I find someone who comes in with a large disc herniation, I rarely see anything but shoulders, but so every now and then I'll see a lumbar spine. They'll come in with a, a, a huge disc herniation. I'll show them some of evidence of healing. And that immediately like de-threatens that concept of a large disc herniation, even though it yeah. may not happen to them and it may not happen quickly, it's possible, you know? So I think that's a really important point you raised. Cool, yeah, mate. No, let's go. That, those, yeah. Let's uh, let's. Uh, we're running out of time. I'm very conscious. You've got four uh, beautiful girls who are <laughs> banging down the door any second to try. Dad, where's breakfast? But uh, let's let. Can we linger for? I'm gonna I'm gonna leave exercise because I think exercise okay. is is kind of obvious. It all it all kinds of works. You can use isometrics. You can use eccentrics. You can use isotonics. You can use plyometrics. <laughs> hopefully in a in a progressive manner, right? You don't have to do yes. one or the other. Is that correct? Are we happy that there? That is correct. That is, yes, absolutely. Ooh. We can nail that one down, absolutely. <laughs> Love it. So I want to just go for a little bit with with imaging, with radiological imaging, because that's that's your wheelhouse. If, so if somebody comes to you, I'm going to say with a, an acute, obvious mid-portion Achilles pain, and I'm also going to say a classic sort of rotator cuff tendinopathy type presentation, the, the cuff one's a bit harder because there's a lot more things you probably have to differentially diagnose, but the mid portion Achilles will start there. What do you do for imaging? I don't do anything for imaging at the start. I mean, I, you know, I work in a different healthcare system, you know, in the NHS patients don't come with a scan. So I would then have to request a scan at the moment that will take a number of weeks. So I, I, if it's a, but now I don't see many, I would argue my practice. I don't see many patients like that uh, in that they're usually sent to me much further down the line but i i don't feel imaging is going to unless there's can i just remind listeners unless there's a clinical suspicion that there's some other joint if there's you know they've got uveitis or you know skin psoriasis don't forget to use paul Kerwin sort of screen him um eight questions to say Am I, I'm, I'm making sure I'm not missing some other important disease here. But if it's classic mid portion, I just I just tend to get them loaded, see them back in cool. six to eight weeks, and then reevaluate. If at that point they weren't improving, I might get Chris to change their loading program. I wouldn't even imagine them at that point. It would need to be 12, 16 weeks down the line. If they were recalcitrant, I'd say, look, let's get 
and, and I usually get an MR because that's quicker at the moment for me. Um, and I talk the patient through that then. Um, so I'm not a huge, although I like imaging, I'm not a huge fan of everybody getting an image. Now, if you go to the States or Australia, patients walk in with you know, an MR and say, look, you know, so, um, but, we just don't have the capacity here. I, I, and personally, I don't see that it adds much to those early patients. In later, agree. more complex patients, it's very important, but not in those early patients. Agree. I think it would be a waste of resources initially. So yeah. what about, let's go to the shoulder, let's go to the upper limb. What's your, and I'm, I know that's not prescriptive. Yeah. I know there's not an algorithm, but like the classic patient who comes in, you're pretty sure there's no red flags based on their signs, symptoms yep. and history and you're an expert. What would you do for imaging? Would you just shelve it or would you go for it? I, I Again, I just, I, I mean, I get standard x-rays of the shoulder every time because I think actually you can, you know, it's underappreciated what you can, you know, you can diagnose cuff tendinopathy on, on x-ray. You can, you know, it can give you a pointer sclerosis on the acromion bit of change to the gt mag up the gt and you might see some pit there's actually if you spend time so i get standard x-ray views and then if a cuff tendinopathy there's no way i'm imaging that them at that point they're getting an exercise program and they're back to see me in probably about eight to 12 weeks just the way i have to work and then i would probably add in if they came back i probably add g i tend to add gtn quite early because look there is a there is a placebo element to that but it's a hook to say to the patient, you're not responding to this, let's change up the loading and let's add this adjunct in, which may work the flip of a coin if you look at the stats. Okay, so it might work for you, it might not, right? Um, and then I would so see- So GTN is again. glycerol trinitrate? Sorry, glycerol yeah. trinitrate, five mil usually a five milligram patch cut into half. That was pioneered by uh, George Morell in Sydney and I think is underutilized. I think it's underutilized to be frank because nobody made any money out of it in the tendon <laughs> world. So that's, that's to be brutally honest. <laughs> But it's a great, it was the first real translational story and I use it quite a bit in my practice. And if, if it's a placebo effect, I don't really care because it's not harming the patient. One in 20 patients might get a headache. It's very safe. Uh, and that's utilizing probably the placebo response, but we probably should use that a bit more. And then down the line, I might, I, I would usually get, um, uh, if it's, uh, you know, usually an AMR, sometimes ultrasound. I'm not really, it just depends what's quicker at the time. And then I do, it's the only area I still sometimes use an injection, albeit I was part of the, I was the, uh, on the grass trial. I, it helps me figure out what's happening with the patient. Um, I, 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 but I use it sparingly. I do use shockwave again down the line if they're, and I, that's normally in six to nine months down the line if they're not improving. I may consider that, although there's not a wealth of evidence. Um, and then you're into the crappy position when you get to be a surgeon, when people come and say, well, you know, I've tried all this, stuff, this and this, and, you know, there is, could you not just do keyhole surgery? And then you're like, well, keyhole surgery doesn't really work. And, oh, but I still want. So I sort of make a deal with my patients at the start and say along the lines, look, I'm a surgeon. I like to operate every Monday, but I ain't going to operate on you for at least a year if you don't have a tear of the rotator cuff here and when your imaging comes you know eventually i say there's no chance you're going to get me you'll have to get a second opinion because it's just not something i would i think is is correct i then discuss with them after a year if they're still coming back and want to kill me then sometimes i will operate and you know you can't again argue against the placebo effect of subacromial decompression because the you know see the seesaw trial showed but if I stick a scope in somebody's shoulder and wiggle it around, there's a huge placebo effect in that. As long as you're truthful, honest, open with your patient and uh, describe that placebo effect and the risks and complications of surgery, is that, I would argue, is that really a bad way to treat a patient? I don't think so because you're, you're, it's a journey with them and you're listening to them and you're informing them. I think mm -hmm. doing an operation in the first three months with a little information because you're going to earn a couple of thousand dollars yeah, I think that's wrong. Mm. So um, that's my, you know, but I agree with you. Cuff is, you know, cuff is the huge challenge of 10 knot thing because it is not the same as the Achilles. It's not the same as, mm. you know, it, it's hard. It's mul mul more multifactorial and, you know, partial thickness tears. How do we, you know, we could go on all day, but that's yeah. my sort of, that's where I sit on that. 
and then you get to the subs gap and the bicep. It all oh, gets a bit a bit tricky. Yeah. Super spinalis is, is all right. I can handle that. So I, I I agree with your stepped approach. Basically, exercise. If that doesn't work, GTN, maybe an injection, maybe shockwave, maybe here. And then a full 12 yeah. months later, you would entertain the idea of a subacromial decompression. I think that's totally fair because, you know, exercise doesn't help everybody. There's, it's like 40 to 50% yeah. of people fail to improve after six months with exercise, right? So yeah. what do we do with half of the population? Exactly. There has to be some sort of... Backup and you'd have to, you know, cool yeah, this is the other thing with pragmatic trialing. You know, people love at the moment to say that orthopedic surgery is crap. They love to show that having, you know, there are a few investigators in Australia who like to say that, you know, a knee scope is never going to work for, um, you know, a meniscal tear. But that isn't, that is a trialing reality in maybe five to 600 patients. The real world that we sit in, the real world I sit here in Glasgow and I see socioeconomic deprived patients who have patients will a, a subset of those patients with the surgery will get better all we need to maybe appreciate is not be so dismissive that we've sort of gone the other way with orthopedic surgery at the moment we're so dismissive that but we shouldn't be as long as the patient has, is getting a procedure at the right time after as you say when everything else has failed rather than getting it maybe at the start i completely agree but it, it pains me a little bit at the moment that larger journals, for example, love to take studies that show a knee scope, a shoulder scope, something, you know, a lumbar decompression doesn't work. And they roll with that and they get media and everybody goes, ah, orthopedic surgeons, they just earn a lot of cash. They do, but maybe it's just that the pathways that we get to surgery need to be better defined, I think. Uh, so... No, I'm a. I'm I'll a stop my rant. I'll stop my I'm rant. A, no, I'm going to stop rant. The 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 orthopedic society of of uh, the UK is not going to kick you out just yet. You've you've made your defence. No. I like it. No, but uh, there there is a place for that because there has to be. We can't just sit on our because, mate. If we were going to police exercise, often exercise oh. doesn't outperform yeah. placebo as well. So everything it has has its own sort of um, shortcomings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Oh, mate, I'm going to let you go. You've got to go and make breakfast. I don't know what you... Hopefully yes, you I've, got, I've, got four bre- I've got four, yeah. four lunches and breakfasts right. to make. Listen, thank you. I hope um, that's been helpful in some way. Um, it's been it's great. Been very good fun. I wish we had two hours. There's a lot more I want to I was, ask I, you. I, know. I think we would need a half <laughs> a day, really. <laughs> Where can people find you? And I'm certainly going to direct people to a lot of your work. Where can people find you on the so, socials? So um, tw- Twitter is at attend in glasgow um i'm also the university uh, website but i mostly you know twitter's quite good because that's where i sort of any papers that come along anything we highlight maybe if i have a rant a certain day i might do that although i try to keep that to a minimum so and i'm more than happy if anybody just wants to email me it's uh, neil n-e-a-l dot miller a-r at glasgow dot ac dot uk look i i think the only way tendon research is going to get better i'm going to finish in this is to say that and what I've learned in my career is <clears throat> collaboration is key. You need to speak to physios. You need to speak to sports physicians. And you need to get out of your siloed box of, I only do this. Because if you do that and collaborate, your patient will get better. You'll learn more. You'll be more enthused. And you'll, as I say, your patient at the end of or that you're sitting in your room will get better treatment. So collaboration is key in my world. A lovely way to finish. Neil Miller, thank you very much. No problem. Thanks, Jared.